This is the fun part where we just assume we're alive. Yay! Welcome to Creative Life Spiritual Center, our soul session. I'm very excited about it. I'm going to talk very little. I'm going to let the introductions be done by Reverend Jesse, but what I am going to do really quickly is I'm going to know that there is one power, one presence, one life, one love, and each and every one of us are divine channels for that power, that presence, that life. We live that life and we are that love. We are the manifestation of that love. And so I am knowing that this amazing conversation will open hearts and open minds and give us new ideas to run with. And I am grateful for these two gentlemen for coming forth into this conversation in the sacred space and knowing that it is all good. And I release my word into law, knowing it is done. And so it is. And so it is. Give me just a second here. <clears throat> Here to pull up the bio of our special guest tonight. He is the Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson. Let's read you what I have. He's an ordained Centers for Spiritual Living Minister and serves as the founding minister and spiritual director of the Center for Spiritually Integrated Arts, which is a CSL teaching center. He brings his years of being an artist, performer, educator, American Sign Language interpreter, and lover of comics and film to all areas of his life and his ministry. He is a frequently sought after guest minister speaker at various churches, centers, and events. In addition to his ministry work, he teaches workshops related to radical self-care, living with purpose, inclusion, diversity, creativity, and more. He is also a professional visual artist, performing artist, and author. When he is not teaching, speaking, writing, creating, performing, etc., he loves spending time with family, which includes harassing his amazing grandkids. And I hope, too, that when he's not teaching, speaking, writing, etc., that he gets plenty of sleep, because it sounds like he's got a full life with many things going on. It is a pleasure to welcome you tonight, Reverend Dr. Anderson. Do you mind if I call you Raymond? Ray. Ray. Okay, Ray. And, and I'm Jesse. Now, Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah. It's an honor. Well, thank you so much. We've been doing these soul sessions since 2017. They were the suggestion of one of our members, Donald John Lewis Jr., Mm -hmm. uh, he and I did the first one, and we've done three, I think, since three or four, at least together, he and I, since then. And the focus of this, they're now sponsored by a group we have, some of whom you just met, called the Be the Change team mm -hmm. at Creative Life, which is about equity and diversity and inclusion, about social justice, racial justice. Um, and the conversations have, have ranged. We've had... Uh, multiple speakers of multiple ages and backgrounds and the conversations have ranged all on all different topics it's right. it's an it's a conversation as as we talked about in the right. in our uh, back and forth setting this up rather than an interview i do want to mention that in the july science of mind magazine there's an excellent article ray wrote and it's called the beloved community and it's on that's the title of tonight's talk as well you'll find it in here i'm leafing through the thing now to give you the page number the july science mind magazine page 20 the beloved community the business of us all and i thought that would give us discussion points to uh i think you and i are going to have an easy time of, of <laughs> conversing and and then i discovered that um you and I had already worked together before, which I did not know because it was on radio and the names went by kind of fast. But we did a thing on Unity Radio mm -hmm. um, together. It's great. Yep. So it's wonderful to make your acquaintance again. So the like beloved mine. community. Uh huh. The beloved community. We are that beloved community. And in this article you wrote, you really called us all out and called us to action to do <laughs> something. Um, as a as a group and you said you don't see a lot of that happening you don't hear a lot of that happening amongst our centers and so on let's talk about that and what is ours to do um 
Let me let me just start with this and 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 throw it to you. Okay. When I came into this organization a long time ago, the the story at the time mm -hmm. was we don't do politics. Uh, we every everything we all, we just treat and we just know that you will hold the vision and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I discovered uh, that Ernest Holmes believed that we should be involved in politics and said so as early as 1918 wow. in that material called love and law that Marilyn Leo found mm -hmm. the unpublished letters. I discovered that Ernest and Fenwick opposed bare knuckle prize fighting. that was happening in Venice, California. When they moved out there, people were dying and they, they staged a, a protest and they and they created a, an initiative to have it banned and it was and somehow that never has gotten brought up the the various courageous moves that people have made along the way in the mm -hmm. ministry taking action right. speaking truth to power yep yep what is the problem now as you see it in our hesitancy going forward Oh, of course. Did like let's let's start with an easy question. So, wow, yes, wow, wow. So it's been my experience and my observation that the problem is unresolved, unhealed, unaddressed things such as. A lot of people pleasing still exist within new thought. A lot of codependency still exists within new thought. And so these two things, my observation is these two things are causing people to do things like, one of the reasons we don't talk about politics is because one of our top tithers is a MAGA supporting Trump person. And if I were to say something about that, he would take his ball and leave. And then what are we gonna do? We can't play volleyball without a ball. So rather than even engage in that, I'm not going to say anything. But we say that we believe that source, God, the universe is the source of all. So then that person who tithes isn't the source of your abundance anyway. However, because we're doing a lot of old new thought instead of new thought, we're still doing a lot of things that aren't really steeped in principle. Um, and I think those are the things that are deeply interwoven into a lot of CSL theology, now, a lot of new thought theology in general, not even just CSL, a lot of new thought theology now where we don't want to take a stand. We like being these individual silos where everybody does their own thing, right? It's like everybody, we're all McDonald's, but everybody does their own burgers and their own cheeseburgers and fish sandwiches their own way. And we don't tell anybody how to do, well, we put two pickles. Well, we put three. Ooh, like we don't individual, rugged individualism and like do your own thing. For us to take a stand and say, this is who we are as new thought. Be it unity, agape, divine science, CSL would mean we're saying, this is how we do burgers. You can go somewhere else where they do burgers differently, but this is how we do them here, which is going to make a lot of people angry and people are going to leave. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. We want more in, we focus on diversity and inclusion, but not to be diverse and inclusive, to have the numbers grow so we have more people and more tithes. So you don't really want diversity and inclusion. You want this. Then say you want that, Yeah. not this. If yeah. this is what you want, then you want this regardless of that. This will be a natural byproduct of 
but really say what it is that you want. It's what we do in visioning. It's what we do in prayer. Say what it is. Jesus said, look, this is my paraphrase from the Ray translation. When you pray, what you need to be doing is declaring that you already have what you're stating rather than asking for. That's what we do in, when we treat. We are declaring. We're not doing that with this whole beloved community thing. And another obstacle is, as a movement, we are minister-centric, not community-centric. And until that model is flipped, the beloved community might exist here at this center, here in this city, here in this place. But as a movement, it's going to continue to be a dream and a vision, but not a manifested reality. Wow. Very good. Very good. Say more, would you please, about being minister-centric. So my observation is that a lot of, and it's, <laughs> so I've often asked folks, specifically within CSL, you know, colleagues and, you know, practitioners and laity and whatnot, just because I like poking the bear. Are we a Christian denomination? Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, the answer is no. And I say, but Holmes said that we are. And then he goes through explaining, we are, but not like this, but this is what we are. Yeah. So are we? Well, I don't think, I hear what you're saying. You don't think, but the founder said, now, I'm not saying we still have to be, we can be open at the top and say, there was a time when, you know, Holmes said, I'm not religious science, you are. You know, at Asilomar, he said, you are religious science. You are the ones who are doing, I'm the one who brought the stuff together and did this and that and the other, but you are the movement. So we can evolve and say, well, now we are whatever it is that we are. However, my point with this is, we as a theological organization are modeled after the Christian model. Mm -hmm. And Christianity is minister-centric for the most part. The minister does this and the minister, you know, yeah, all of that. So here we are in New Thought and it's still, well, the minister needs this and the minister, keep the minister happy and the minister and the, the cult of personality and all of that stuff. Rather than saying, this is, this is in, in my vision, the minister serves as the CEO. So for me, a center is sort of like a four-pronged, there's, there's this hub and there, there are these areas. A center serves as a hospital where someone who is going through whatever they're going through, they come in for triage. They want prayer. They want a practitioner session. Boom, and they're gone. Well, that's the same thing that a hospital. Hospitals don't do like you know Holiday Inn and come on in and stay a while. No, I'm not. I, I no, I'd rather not. You come in, you triage, you get what you need to get, and you go. We try to cling to people. So, but center as hospital, center as community center where people who want to come together and fellowship and do the potlucks and the bingo, and we do that as well. Center as place of worship, where you come and you do, I recognize that I am the isness and allness of God, individualizing itself as me, and all of the things around worship or worthship or whatever we want to call it. And then lastly, it is a place of education where we are offering classes, workshops, et cetera, to assist people in awakening to their own divine magnif spiritual magnificence. All four of these things ideally serve as the community. Mm -hmm. The minister ideally should be the CEO who helps make sure that everything's going to you know, operate and smoothly and whatnot, whatnot, rather than minister as Pope who has yeah. the authority of whatever, where congregates, it's that whole idea of authority figures. And the minister is up here rather than here with the people. The minister should be one. Of, Jesus walked with the people, 
right? Like all of the ministers, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marched with the people. He was out there with the people, not in some, you know, ivory tower somewhere just dictating words. So instead of being here as practitioners support the minister, yes. However, how does the minister also support the community? Like it has to be inhale, exhale, yin, yang. It's both and. So when the minister sees I am a part of this community, I am invested in this community, rather than it's about me. Y'all come here to see me, don't you? Mm -hmm. It can't be that. And I'm not saying that specifically there are ministers who, although there are some, I'm not saying that that's the, it's the energy of this is my center versus our center. This is our community. And as the minister, how do I lead the charge to say, you know, this is where our community is located. This is the actual property where we are located. But this center as a community is within the community of, and it reminds me of that song from Sesame Street, who are the people in your neighborhood? As the minister, it is my job to go out and meet the people in the neighborhood so that they know who we are. So that they also know that if you ever need anything, this is one of the things that I loved about growing up in the Baptist Christian movement was in, in the quote unquote black church. It didn't matter if you were a member of that church or not. If you wanted to learn how to write a resume, you want to learn how to type, just show up. There's a class for it. Now you may stay as a member or you whatever, but you just show up to get that. You need clothes here. You need food here. We're here to be of service to the community. If the minister is the person of authority, like the Pope, that's not going to happen. A world that works for all isn't going to happen. It can't because the model needs to be flipped where it's community. The minister is part of the community, not a triangle where the minister is at the top of the triangle and everything down here holds and supports them up. That model has to be eradicated. It has to be deconstructed. Yeah. Does, de does deconstructing that draw us further away from the Christian model and and more into the model of the Sangha or more into the model of the of the ashram or something? Yeah. Where it's uh-huh. In my because, mind, yes. Yeah. It's the idea. And and for me, like I love the word, the Hawaiian word ohana. You know, ohana means family. Like the 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 uh, I think it's Pixar cartoon Lilo and Stitch. Ohana means family, and family never gets like no one gets left behind. Uh -huh. Like that idea of we are a communal species. The vast majority of people that I have met, including myself, the thing that made us stay or become members of a CSL in the first place was we get there, we check it out. And some, this is the first place I feel like I belong. Mm -hmm. And only, I've never heard someone say, you know, I showed up and I felt like I fit in. I hear the word belonging 99% belong. of the time. And it's, I, I, it's either, I feel like I belong or I feel, feel like everything that I have fought my entire life. Yes. This is it. Yeah. Like that's the other percent, but it's this idea of belonging. That's community. The, the traditional Christian model, while there are aspects of community, the idea is you're broken. You're a sinner. You, the devil is always nipping at your heels, et cetera, et cetera. That's not really community. Um, there's a young lady, if I'm not mistaken, her name is Kelly Harrell, Kelly D. Harrell, I think. And she says, we don't heal in isolation. We heal in community. So we have to come together and recognize community is more than just the people within the walls of our center. Community is more than just 
the banner of CSL or the banner of Agape or the banner of unity or the banner of Republican, Democrat, what it, it's community is humanity. Community is the animals in the ecosystem where you are. Because if one thing in the community, the ecosystem goes off, then everything else is affected. So we have to start understanding community is also how we tend and care for the trees, how we tend and care for the environment, how we tend and care for every aspect of how God is showing up. And God is showing up as everything because it's all there is. Mm -hmm. So how are we stewarding, right? Like how are we stewarding all of this magnificent divinity everywhere rather than tupperwareing it away and and segregating and separating and polarizing and all that's not going to create the beloved community you mentioned that in your article you used the term compartmentalization and how uh, there's a tendency sometimes to think if it's not my problem it's nobody's problem if i'm not suffering tonight yeah let me ask you this do you think uh, and this is not a binding answer at, in any way to give. Do you think we bit off more than we could handle when we decided to be a religion? When Holmes capitulated and said, all right, let's go ahead and ordain ministers and do all of this <laughs> instead of just have practitioners. Because there's there's a, there's a tacit promise that a religion makes of, of cradle to grave care. As you as you beautifully pointed out, we will feed you, we will clothe you, we will we'll we'll be here for you, we'll triage you, we'll do what's necessary. I didn't get a lot of that in ministerial school. I've had to learn that on the fly. Mm -hmm. All of us have. Uh, the emphasis was always on, you know, troward. The emphasis was always on this this body of knowledge and how to communicate mm -hmm. this knowledge. It was intellectual and that was useful and all because we do have a message that you can't just, I can't just Google sermon topics on the <laughs> internet and get stuff that's useful to me. Right, because right. We're, we're in a completely different conversation. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it would be, our mission would look a lot different if we were simply teaching centers that offered classes. And we're not a membership organization and did not have something that that looks like ministry and that pushes everybody's buttons about authority issues, whether or not we're projecting that or know that we're projecting that. And that's an issue I know you face and I've faced it too as a man in ministry. We look more like the shaming clergy of the past than we don't. And we have to back and fill and explain we're not like that. We're not a salvation-based organization. You're already, you're not broken, except in some ways that you may describe yourself, but you're not, by God, mm -hmm. broken. Mm -hmm. You didn't, Adam and Eve's disobedience and all that nonsense. Right. And so it's, um, we have to earn people's trust every single day. Uh, and And then, yeah, try to, try to take care of them and try to uh, try to foster a community of love. Mm -hmm. um, you brought up the excellent point of money. And I think if you were to look at a lot of these soul sessions that we've had before, it's been a through line and probably 75, 80% of them are right. money. What's back of racism? Money. What's back of colonialism? Money. What's back? Yeah. It's yeah, it comes down to and people pleasing and needing the big tithers to come up. But we're not a religion. If we are a religion that is necessary. No religion is necessary. Right. They're all invitational. Right. Right. If we went, if we sold off our buildings, as many of our places have done since the pandemic, and we all met under a tree, that mm -hmm. would be fine. That would be lovely, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some, <laughs> for some, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's pride and there's ego and there's yeah. this that comes into it. And how how successful are we? One last thing, I get off this point, but uh, <laughs> this: uh, how long have you been involved with CSL? Oh, 
I think all total, like specifically from the moment I first stepped into a CSL all the way up till today, probably 17, between 17 and 20 years, somewhere in there. Okay. This may At have least. been slightly before your time with us, um, but there at one point when the Holmes Institute was reinventing itself, in fact, I'm not sure it was called the Holmes Institute yet in the model that we have now. Mm -hmm. And it was long before the two organizations integrated. Mm -hmm. They put out an ad campaign to practitioners to become ministers. And I don't have the thing in front of me because I didn't know this was going to come up, but I have it in the files someplace. Mm -hmm. It was basically be a rock star. Yeah, uh -huh. that was the appeal. Right. And I thought then, and I think now, then who are you speaking to? What unhealed issues in people are going to get, are going to get, pro ooh, power, control. Yep, and exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, and it's funny you should mention it, because like right before this, I was meeting with our weekly Wednesday night Science of Mind and Spirit discussion group and some things came up regarding like politicians and christian nationalism and variety of things came up and i said pause for a second and instead of thinking it about thinking about it as that particular label think about it like addiction whatever it is whether someone is addicted to pornography or meth or power or pseudo power, it's all addiction. And for someone to say, oh, wait a minute, did you did you see the advertisement? Oh, I can I can be a rock star. And you and you you're buying it, you're addicted now. You have you have taken your first hit of the power pipe, and I'm liking what this, you know, people are treating me differently, and I, I'm getting the best of this and the best of. Okay, well, you're doing the exact same thing that you're just, there's a very thin, fine line between that and Charles Manson. Mm. <laughs> between that and Koresh. Between that and Jones and Jonestown. There's a very fine line between it's all about me and it's all about me. And so to go back, the question of did we bite off more than we can chew? I think in some ways, yes. However, now that it's been bitten, how do we digest it most effectively? Mm -hmm. Because right now we are bloated and gassy with heartburn and on the verge of diarrhea. That's not healthy for us as an organization. So what do we do? How do we, and I mean, really, and I invite the folks in the discussion class, deconstruct science of mind and spirit. You know, the, the audience that Holmes is talking to is a very specific audience. It's not necessarily the audience of today. So as people today who have AI on your phone, they knew nothing about that then. So read it, extrapolate from it. How do I apply this? Like I've been telling folks, for me, there, we are in the era of science of mind and spirit 4.0. Because there's a science of mind and spirit, Ernest Holmes. There's the science of mind and spirit post Ernest Holmes after he made his transition. And there are now two separate organizations. There's the science of mind and spirit when those two organizations came together as one. And now there's the, well, that merger has happened. The Okay, so now who are we? Now what are we? What are we practicing? What do we believe? What are we doing? Because when we say a world that works for all, what does that mean? And I tell people when you have a difficult time with that, pick one thing that you're passionate about. Education, how do you make, and rather than all of education, you have one elementary school a couple blocks down from your house, how do you participate in making that an elementary school that works for every child, every teacher, every staff member, and the administrators who go there? How do you make that work for them? 
Start there. The Good Samaritan didn't go up and say, set up a business and say, yes, I'm the Good Samaritan and I'd like to I'd serve 3,000 people a day. And the Good Samaritan started with one person, helped one person. So if that's what you're passionate about and it's in your community, do something about it. Whatever that is, wherever that is, do something about it. So that then when we as an organization say a world that works for all, what does it mean for us to be an organization that works? How do we ensure, well, that means I have to do like, and I often separate this and say, the same thing that physicians do, physicians come together at conferences, et cetera, and they look at, you know, they don't look at x-rays and MRIs and, oh, wow, great. They look at x-rays and MRIs and say, this is a diseased heart, this is brain, the, the feet, the spinal cord, like these are the things and these are the issues. Now we, as the professionals, how do we assist our patients to be as healthy as possible? They address the issues that their patients face and they address them in a very scientific, oh, science of mind, in a very scientific and procedurable, procedural based way. We're metaphysicians. Mm -hmm. We have to stop denying, well, God is good and everything is good and it's all good. If you believe in racism or racism affects you, then it's in your consciousness and time out, time out, time out. That's old new thought. And that's the same thing as there's an anthropomorphic God that's either giving you the disease or it's the devil giving you the disease or pause and stop with the there is a natural world with a variety of things that are going on. And to say that my consciousness somehow created the prostate cancer that I was diagnosed with in December, for me, is metaphysical malpractice. So now we can say, as a metaphysician, with this diagnosis, what is mine to do? How do I take responsibility and accountability for my mental equivalent? today so that i can be as healthy as possible yeah when do we do that as an organization hmm. what's not working ministerially educationally with the practitioner is there are there things that are not working are not functioning well identify them change them heal them transform them whatever words work but do the work so that we are functioning, yes, a, a big bite, yes. But now that it's there, chew it. And small swallows, like whatever it is, so it can digest properly, so that we are nourished effectively as a body called Centers for Spiritual Living. Because right now, there, there's, there's too much, and we're, we're hoping, and we're wishing, but not enough working based on my observation. And, and I'm not saying that there aren't, because there are people working. I'm saying as an entire organization, that's not there yet because we still have pockets of people who are operating based upon the model of colonization. Mm -hmm. We still have people who are operating on the, okay, so e if we're religious science, then stop blending A Course in Miracles so deeply in there that we can't tell the difference. I don't have a problem. If you want to teach A Course in Miracles, cool. But don't blend it and make it like it's all the same thing because mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. Because Course in Miracles is quick to say it's all an illusion anyway. And Holmes said, no, 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 no. It's as real as it needs to be. We don't tell that man that he's not sick. If you need a dime, then pray for a dime. If you're hurt and you want, then pray for that. Go there. He doesn't say, well, if you need a dime, then why don't you already have it? Or you, there is no such thing as sickness. So no, he, it's as real as it needs to be. It's as real as you feel it. Is. Racism, sexism. I don't even call it homophobia anymore because they're not afraid of us. It's hatred. It's homomisia. So. How do we bring our teaching 
dead square center in the midst of those diseases. If consciousness is all consciousness creates, the law says yes, then somebody somewhere for, like you said, money. You know what? If I go over to Africa and I kidnap some folks and turn, that's free labor. What is the consciousness that that person had to have had to kidnap people, make them into property, enslave them simply so they could be rich? Because that consciousness exists today. And if we don't address it in consciousness and heal it, what are we changing? We're, we're not changing anything. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> My head's about to explode with things I want to bring up. This is great. On this last point, we've had several speakers in this in this in these soul sessions bring up that Europeans went to Africa and captured and enslaved people because of money and biblically justified it. Right. Because of slaves obey thy masters. Right. And uh, one man was talking about Howard Thurman, and he said Howard Thurman's mother would not permit the epistles of Paul to be read in the home because of just that. Right. So there's a school of thought of expediency. Mm -hmm. Let's not only enslave these people, but they're sitting on diamonds. Mm -hmm. Um. Wow. The the problem has existed for a very long time within CSL and a lot of history uh, in New Thought, I think, has been shoveled under. Not everybody's on the same page. Right. Everybody likes the idea, generally speaking, if they're drawn to this at all, of the oneness of all people but with asterisks and footnotes. Mm -hmm. And you find this in the writings of the people. I've, I've been a fan of Ernest Holmes, but early on it was suggested to me to listen to what he listened to and read who he read. And so I did, and then I read who they read, and you can you go on forever with that back to the mists mm -hmm. of time before anybody wrote anything. Right. And you find in there these sidebars and these different things that go off the rails that, uh, uh, for instance, I wrote an article uh, 10 so years ago for the magazine on Comet, on Comedic religion, because I had just started reading about it and I was fascinated by it. Nobody else had written about it. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, let me do it. And I wasn't trying to culturally appropriate. I was trying to educate and just mm -hmm. put the information out there. Right, right. And uh, I brought up in there how the human species arose in West Central Africa, which is not news to anybody who's followed any kind of science, archaeology, or what have you. And I got a letter. I got a letter from this person who said, I'm not from Africa. I'm not from Africa. I don't want to be associated with that. And this was a person presumably in our organization because mm -hmm. we're reading it in our magazine. And since, as you mentioned, now we've gone online and we're, you know, I used to speak and all of us used to speak to whoever was in the room. And that was pretty much it. And we put it on cassette or CD. And if you wanted right, it, right. you could get it. But you were, right. you know, it was contained. Right. Right. Yes. Well, now it's out there for everybody. Yes. And people have. Um, how shall I put this? Um, clutch their pearls is a very gentle way of um, at the idea that you mean everybody. You mean everybody belongs? Well, I didn't know that. And then I think to myself, well, you haven't been listening. You haven't been watching. You haven't been seeing what we've been doing here. It's mm -hmm. never come up before. Plus the fact that people sitting next to each other on a Sunday never used to know how each other thought about things until they went on social media. And now they're aghast at what somebody believes. Mm -hmm. And among among straight white people, there's a belief that you hear that a package is being presented of inclusion and diversity for absolutely everyone. And this is going to cost us. This is going to make us uncomfortable. This is going to marginalize us. And my God, we built civilization. Right. This is not just a sentiment that's out there in the world. This is within new thought as well. Right, and, right. and I have heard it and I've heard it alluded to. And I, there have been conversations 
where it's it's come up and people have batted it away but it's still there mm -hmm. um i don't know who we look to for a model of what to do right here i'm kind of offhand thinking the quakers you know i'm kind of offhand um gosh i don't know you know i i like a lot of what baha'i is up to but in Baha'i, homosexuality is an abomination against God. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it seems like there's always somebody falling off the end of the bench. <laughs> yes. Yep. And then the matter of consciousness you bring up, beautifully put. There's a belief, yeah, that whatever you manifest, you somehow, you somehow created it. And I think that person that wrote me the letter about I'm not from Africa brought up Edgar Casey. Because I've heard that before. Casey and also Rudolf Steiner believe there are five races on this earth, and each one of them was assigned a continent. And that's where they were to stay put, and wow. they were to do the best they could there. And that kind of thinking has infiltrated New Thought. It's come in through Troward. It's come in through um, uh, some of the people that he ran around with in the, in the uh, British-Israelite movement, where they thought the Anglo-Saxon... Uh, Anglo-Saxons were the lost tribe because, you know, the lost tribe has been claimed by a number of different mm -hmm. groups. And this stuff kind of kind of lingers in there. And if only you could pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you'd be fine. Yep. And that brings us to the question of, of white, male, straight normalization. Yep. Very much but so. The best music, we talked about this in a previous session, you know, that all of us are indoctrinated, whoever we are, in that the best music is Mozart and Beethoven and the best writing is Shakespeare. And it's all it's all Northern European, essentially, you know, and it's all it's all that. And, mm -hmm. and what you do is fine and entertaining, but it's not great art unless mm -hmm. it approximates <laughs> that. Uh huh. So we see the world through this through this lens. And now at the 50th anniversary of hip hop, classical music never changed the world like hip hop has in 50 right. years. In 400 right. years, classical music hasn't done that. Right, right. It's had a certain little audience that's been interested in it. And it's beautiful mm -hmm. stuff and it takes great, great skill to play. But, right. but the idea of influence, clothing and film and yeah. television. Yeah. 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 And, and constructive anger. The channeling yeah. of constructive anger. Yep. I hate how my life looks right now. I hate how my people are being treated. And so I'm going to put that into, into entertainment. I'm going to put that into a rallying cry mm -hmm. that others can hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm rambling. Oh, hear. no, you're good. You're good. Uh, you know. You did say something um, just real quick when you mentioned... You know how people could sit in the same pews and not know until social media and that reminded me it's because the way once again because it's not community oriented we've set it up where people gather to watch just like going to the play going to theater going to see an opera you don't chat with the person next to you about life ideals and goals and stuff we're there to see a show. Church or centers have become, we're here for this. We're not here for this or this, which is why now that we have social media and it's like, oh, I can see what Jesse, oh, what? Jesse shared something about Kemet. Kemet. I don't even know how to say it, but he shared about it and I don't like it, right? Well, I wouldn't have known that otherwise. But pause and let me ask myself, now that I know this, how does that affect who I thought they were? And what is my invitation now? Because if I'm finding myself wanting to judge, I can't believe, I, how dare they believe that there are five different races on five different continents and that how dare they? What is my invitation as someone who practices this teaching what is my invitation in the most healthy and life-affirming way to build community, to nurture community, rather than just say, you're now the enemy? Mm -hmm. What is that going to do? Like I tell people, regardless of what political person in Florida or whatever, whoever's being indicted, 
regardless of any of that, simply calling them the enemy and making it about them and it's their fault doesn't change the core thing that created the issues in the first place. So my invitation is to say, do I want to live in the beloved community? Then how do I have conversation with people who aren't like me? How do I have conversation with straight, we'll go straight white men who don't like gay people? How do I, as a black gay man, have a conversation with someone who thinks that I should be stoned to death? How do I do that? How do I have conversations? I don't know what it's like to be a woman. How do I have conversations with women? How do I have conversations with transgender individuals? How do I have conversations with non-binary, non-gender conforming individuals? How do I have conversations with people who are older and people who are younger than me? How do I get out of my comfort zone to actually say, community is all of us. And if I don't learn, because I've got to start it, if I don't learn how to communicate, cooperate, and collaborate, then I will never be able to co-create. Mm. It's not going to be possible because I'm busy pushing people away rather than saying, I don't agree with what you posted or I don't agree with that ideology. I don't agree with that, whatever. I don't agree with that. But that doesn't change that I know who I am. I know what I am. I know what you are, even if you don't know, I know that you are God individualizing itself. I know that. So how does that change how I treat you? Mm-hmm. It may not change how you treat me, but how with healthy boundaries, because I ain't going to just let you walk up on me and, you know, some healthy boundaries, but I'm the one as a practitioner. I'm the one who knows the truth. People come to me for prayer. I don't have to say, well, time out, time out. Before we sit down and pray, Ray, I need to know your political affiliation, what you think about gay people, and if you voted. Okay, I don't need to know that to pray. Well, if I don't need to know that to pray, then I don't need to know that to have a conversation with this person. I don't need to know that prior to to have conversation with this person or anybody. I'm anchored in truth and in principle. And that should inform me in how I show up in the world. That's one reason why I put the quote in there um, in the article when maybe Till Mobley said, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, I was up in Chicago in an apartment, comfortable. And, you know, I always thought whatever the Negroes in Mississippi are doing, that's their problem until they lynched my child. And then I realized that Whatever happens to any of us anywhere had better be the business of all of us everywhere. We have to be the community, the family, the support for everybody. That's why I said, am I my brother's keeper? No, I am my brother and he is me. Am I my sister's keeper? No, I am her and she is me. Am I my gender non-conforming siblings keeper? No, I am them and they are me. We have to start realizing that it's about that rather than us versus them. Mm-hmm. No, it's us and them. Because Here's- if we're in one apartment building, you know, you're on the third floor, I'm on the fourth floor and Hitler's on the ninth floor and he sets fire to the building. You and me in our apartments on the third and fourth floor, we're not like, ain't got nothing to do with us. That's his apartment. He he burned his stuff up. No, because eventually, if unchecked, our apartments are going to burn down too. That's where we are now, not just organizationally, not just as a country, as a planet. We are being invited to realize the people in Russia, Korea, the entire continent of Africa, South America, wherever on the planet, this tiny, beautiful blue marble, wherever we are, if somebody sets fire there, if somebody blows this up there, it affects all of us. 
the nuclear disaster in Fukushima several years ago. Mm -hmm. It affected far more than just those people in Japan. Accountability of how do I steward the beloved community? How do I vision it? How do I make it my mental equivalent? So it's my thoughts, my words, my emotions and feelings, and my actions. So that when I treat and move my feet, it's about the business of the beloved community in all ways, shapes, and forms for me. And and me. And And part of that is we have to deconstruct the almighty dollar. Like just the energy of, well, because we're still, we're still toxic capitalism. It's still, you know, no people aren't bound in chains and being whipped by, by a bull whip the way we once were, the way my ancestors were. No, that's not, but we're still being whipped today. We're being whipped every time we hear about another mass shooting or another school shooting. We're being whipped with the trauma of that. Every time we hear about another natural disaster, like in Hawaii right now, we're being whipped with global warming, the climate change. And if you don't set yourself free, if you don't change the systems, then the whippings will continue. Well, then time out and pause. How do we deconstruct all of this and really start holding one another accountable, Mm -hmm. holding one another accountable, and then letting that ripple out so that when we show up to city council meetings, school board meetings, show up at Senate, at the Capitol, or wherever, and we have the opportunity to hold consciousness, or better yet, speak from that consciousness, then speak that into existence versus the alternative where we are enslaved to the cell phones our children are enslaved to how many likes did i get on instagram and they're slaves to that how do we because i keep telling folks just the fact that our in our declaration of principles um number five we believe the ultimate goal of life to be a complete emancipation, complete freedom from all discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. That right there says we are a liberation theology. Mm-hmm. Then let's live it. How do we set people, ourselves and others, free? Free from toxic patriarchy, free from the heteronormativity of the white cisgender male. How do we set people free from all of these ills that we know people are suffering from? And we, as a movement, we're primed to help do this. We have to stop being afraid to do it. We got to get out there and do it. Are we going to fall? Yes. Is it going to be messy? Yes. You find me one potter who uses a wheel to throw clay and they're clean. (laughs) Part of the creation process is the mess. Be willing to get messy and do it anyway. Going back a bit to having the difficult conversation with the person who is not like you does it feel to you like the best way to approach that is to start on a neutral subject to look for uh consensus to look for agreement on isn't it a lovely day or you're my neighbor now (laughs) and we put our trash out on tuesdays uh, you know and our kids go to the same school and this kind of thing Mm -hmm. and kind of zipper it up from there Yes. Rather than I hear you voted for so and so because I saw this on your feed or I saw it on next door, which, by the way, is about the most toxic social media platform generally available that I've run across because somebody will say uh, raccoons got into my trash last night and within about three responses, it's politics. 
(laughs) Right, right. Yes. I have a gun and I'm not afraid to use it and this kind of thing. And you just put your head in your hands. But to to build that kind of that kind of normalization of, oh, and then you find out, you know, this and that about about your neighbor but they're already your neighbor and they're already part of your beloved community on your street and it's like well now now i have a friend who's different than i am great yes. and i realize that implies a certain emotional uh, uh maturity right uh, emotional stability you don't want anything from me you're not trying to take anything from me that's been a fear that a lot of us have uh ingrained into us uh, you know, climb on board and pull the ladder up after you. I've worked hard for what I've got. Mm-hmm. I've heard I've heard white people say, hey, I struggle too. Nobody ever gave me anything. And, rah, rah, rah. and then to have the conversation from that point forward that says, yes, but you were the beneficiary of a system mm-hmm. that was so completely rigged in your favor. Right. Uh, is you, all, all you get, it descends into this massive argument. Right. So you say, well, what what if you hadn't had that? What if, you know, what if certain other things have been true? For, who would you be today? Mm-hmm. Dream along with me here. Imagine these different things. In mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. And so we get to the point of being delighted. The image that I love, uh, and I, I don't know where it, where it came from, but just the, the image of being delighted by our differences and running toward each I, i'll never forget let, let me digress for just a moment here and i i think i did not know you were a gay man so this story may uh, <laughs> uh may have a special meaning for you uh ron do you know ron and sandy scott uh do you know those names sandy yes. um they they um they divorced at one point but when i met them they were a couple okay. and they had come through Terry Cole Whitaker's ministry in okay. San Diego um, and then came into what was then United Church of Religious Science and they and they co-founded a church in West Hollywood and in the 1980s um, they began an active hands-on HIV AIDS ministry where they were working with young gay men who were symptomatic heavily symptomatic wow uh, ranging from things like sarcoma to dementia. Wow. And they provided uh, bedside care, uh, sem- you know, un- unskilled nursing care, mm-hmm. the two of them and their team and their practitioners. And they were looking to enroll other churches. We were called churches. And they were mm-hmm. looking to enroll other churches in doing this. And ours was one that, that stepped in uh here in texas but they were told and i know this firsthand because i was standing there when they were told it we don't do this uh there are liability issues there's this there's that and what we do is we you know we we treat and we we know the best and sandy and if she's watching this i hope she doesn't mind my bringing this up but she she quoted Holmes from the textbook uh, where he said, we look at discordant fact in the face and see the truth behind it. And she said, so we're looking discordant facts in the face. Men are men are dying and they're shunned. And people are running, and this is Louise Hayes said this, but the people are running away from them should be running toward them. Yep. Toward yep. them. And there was a seismic shift in the organization at that point because they were both very vocal about it. And Ron actually went around the country and did trainings for different churches that wanted to set up HIV AIDS care teams. And it was a beautiful thing that he did. And this was pre the AZT cocktail and pre, you know, where symptoms were unmanageable. Mm -hmm. There was a spiral downward that was, you know, it seemed medically unavoidable. Right. Um, but it, it created a seismic shift in our organization. And all of a sudden, a lot of LGBTQ people came out of actual or virtual closets in our organizations. Uh, leaders, members, practitioners, what have you. All of a sudden, there was a sense of we've been here all along, but we didn't know it was safe to say yep. so. Yep. And that was really in the early 90s when that that kind of thing began and uh, that openness and that trust and that welcoming it was a, it was a terrific thing um 
when I first walked into a committee meeting of United Church in 83, when I was a practice, I just got my practitioner license. Uh, there was a man on the team. We all sat in the, at the old headquarters building mm -hmm. and uh, smoking everybody. It was the old days. <laughs> and, uh, right, right. <laughs> and there was this man at that time, I would guess in his early 60s, um, who I was introduced to all these people. I met them all in one fell swoop. You don't remember anybody's name or anything except right. there's this room full of people. Right. And uh, and this guy, uh, it, 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 he was a distinguished minister and, and, and everybody loved him. And at lunchtime, his uh, his husband came in. And uh, and kissed him, and everybody in the room kissed on the husband, and everybody was kissing and hugging on everybody else. And I thought, I've come to the right place, <laughs> right? Because there was no ever any right. Was I present for every conversation? Of course not. Who knows what goes on behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. But in this group, and they were all leaders in the in the church at the time. I thought, yeah, yeah, this is this is what I want to model, and this is how I, I want things to work. Right. That. So I've seen glimpses of it. I've seen it happening, mm -hmm. and I just long for uh, the world that you speak of and the beloved community. Yeah. I and I know it's possible. I know yeah. it's possible. Yeah. And you say that in your article, you know, yeah. we, we can do this. Yes. With enough with enough action. Amen. With enough centeredness. I, I think we have some questions and comments because I see Reverend Lisa. No, we do not, but it's we, oh, it's a the chat has been very active, mostly quoting Ray. Yeah. fantastic because well i want to write that down somebody in the somebody's got it in the chat so the chat's been very active not questions per se um i did see one comment uh and maybe you both can speak to this uh because i definitely would speak to this is uh when you made the comment about zippering up what about the communities that are in active danger because i don't know i forgot where ray is but we're in texas and our lgbt community especially our trans community they are in active danger now yep, yep. we don't have time to zipper up to that conversation right you want to go first jesse yeah we um every year have a pride musical we've done this well, we had to put it off because of the pandemic. We're having the 10th anniversary in the 12th year of the Pride musical. Um, but here in Houston, where we have a huge gay pride parade, uh, gets three quarters, uh, what is it, 750,000, 800,000 people come mm. out for this parade. But the festival that goes along with it, the Art and Music Festival, was canceled this year because of threats. Right. During the parade, they could have authorized enough law enforcement and whatnot to put right. snipers on roofs and stuff but um yeah so it's a it's an issue for us and we've talked about um other ways to serve where we protect people give them a safe space try to keep them free from danger as much as possible while still standing in our truth and it's not easy decisions to make right you know so yeah and for me, like one of the things that I do is I engage people on all the social media platforms that I'm on. So when I see, especially if it's something that someone says on my page. So recently I started sharing things on my social media platform to start informing people in new thought. Do you even know that this is going on? Because you are so ostrich head in the sand that you don't even realize that there are people trying to cross the river and there's actually saw blades and barbed wire to stop them. And not only is it not stopping them, not just stopping them, it's hurting them and killing them. You don't even know about that. You, which means if you don't know about it, you can't pray about it. Pray about it. So I'm bringing things to people's attention. 
I follow all kinds of folks, uh, transgender influencers, because as a gay man, I don't know all the things LGBTQ. So I follow them to educate myself on what do you need? Because I can't be of service if I don't even know what you need. So I want to hear it from you. What do you need? You as an indigenous woman whose daughter is still missing. What do you need? You in Hawaii, what do you need? So I do my best to tag in with people all over the place to, one, educate myself. But when I see or hear or read, people come up with the whatever comments, because um, people say some very horrendous things. Oftentimes, like the, the, the thing that you said, Jesse, about, um, you know, when people say, rather than having the conversation, so you voted for blah, 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 I don't agree with you. I often ask people questions like, so yes, I understand that you as a white person, yeah, you struggle, a bunch of people struggle. I'm, I'm, I understand completely, but I have a question for you. Have you ever been pulled over because you're white? Have you ever been followed around a store because you're white? Has that ever happened to you? Just because you're white, the answer is always no. So I just want you to understand that just because of this brown skin, I am looked at differently. We both struggled. No one's saying you didn't struggle. No one's saying that I'm not taking that away from you. I understand that that is your lived experience. All I'm asking you to understand is the color of your skin affords you certain things that the color of my skin still gets me judged for. And most of the time when I engage people from that perspective, usually seven out of 10 times, people will say, you know what? I never thought of it that way. Huh? Fascinating. And then we're able to, but yes, I'm with you uh, having the conversation just to have conversation. Hey, what's your name? Where do you go? What do you, because I got some neighbors here in Delaware who, you know, they voted for whoever they voted for, anti-gay, anti-this, anti-that. They don't know my position. I know theirs because I saw what they post, you know, in their lawn. Mm. But when I walk past their house, I still, hey, Tom, what's up? How's it going? How you doing? How's the wife? How's the kids? How's the cats? Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like Marvel Comics. Yeah. You too? Cool. And I go about my business because when he gets to know me, then he's more willing to get to know me. And then in getting to know me, we understand that we are both in the same community and that we are working on the same things. I'm not going to be oppositional and, you know, you're a Republican. Ah, what is that? What is that? What is that going to do? Why would a practitioner say, oh, you have what? What, what the, that's not, that's not going to do any good. So what is the truth of the situation? God is all there is and God is love. Cool. Now that I know that, then every word that comes out of my mouth, whoever I'm speaking to, I'm going to say it in the most loving, compassionate, unity building way possible. Even if that is, this is my boundary. That's yours live long and prosper. Like whatever it is, it's going to be done in a loving way, not in uh, a form of animosity or vengeance or venom. So yeah, definitely have the conversations because like you said, people are literally dying. Children are being shot because there are adults who will not have the conversation about gun violence. Mm -hmm. We have to have the conversations. And because we do it with love, it's possible. Exactly. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. So, so this is the reason I'm still here doing what I do is because I, I have such a background that I know what my life used to be like. And I know what this teaching afforded me the ability to, when I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in December, if I didn't have this teaching... I would have completely melted down. But because of it, I was able to stay centered while feeling all of the emotions. 
Okay. And still being grounded and centered, which then gave me the ability to see each of my options with a sense of clarity, not urgency. What's the option one, two, three, four? Let me take it in the prayer of meditation. I'm going to go with surgery. So April 25th, I had my prostate removed. And still with all of the practice. So I know what this teaching can do because I know what it did for me. Which means I know what it can do for others, which means I know what it can do for the world. I know we can build the beloved community. I've seen pockets of it. We just need to make that more contagious. Mm -hmm. This has been a phenomenal time together. And I know. You probably think we say that to all our guests, <laughs> and and we probably do, you know. Yes, because each one is. Because each one, and this has been absolutely, absolutely brilliant tonight. Thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. For your Thank time. you. And if you're Thank up for you. it, we'll do this again. We'll do this Sounds again good. if you like. Excellent. Right? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Anytime I get to chat with you, man, come on now. Oh. Of course, I'm going to say yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> come Thank on you. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else from the uh, the chat? Uh, You're getting a whole lot of love. Well, that's always welcome. Oh, yeah, definitely. The chat has been very busy. Busy. I would definitely suggest you go back and read it. Yeah, totally. We'll do. We'll do. All Excellent. right. Well, Thank do you, you want to bring the others back on screen so they can offer thanks? Um, well, are you ready for me to cut the live stream? <laughs> we have to at some point it's uh i mean i i got nothing else to do tonight and this is this is fantastic yeah, yeah ray he'll keep talking so <laughs> here's, here's here's ray would you please do us the honor of speaking the good word to close mm. us out yes yes yes, yes. <clears throat> so simply anchoring in this divine moment i'm allowing this divine breath in and divine breath out this divine Ruach Elohim, breath of God, to be breathed, recognizing that this breath anchors us to the present. We can't take a breath from yesterday and breathe it today. We can't take a breath from tomorrow and breathe it. We can't save a breath for a rainy day. Only this divine participation in respiration as God breathes itself as each one of us. And in this place of presence, I speak this word from the end. Amen. Amen that I know that a world that works for all is already fully formed and fully functioning in the one mind. There is only one mind and that mind is God. And that mind is my mind now. And this idea of the beloved community exists fully formed and fully functioning already. So now my mental equivalent and what I say about me is the truth of all. My mental equivalent, my thoughts, beloved community, my words, beloved community, my feelings and emotions, beloved community, my actions, beloved community. The law says yes, without fail, yes. Beloved community, yes. Love and compassion, yes. Unity and oneness, yes. Divine realization, yes. The law says yes. We are not bound by precedent. We are bound by principle and principle, the law, principle, this teaching, principle, the truth, the whole truth, and only that which is the truth. We are God incarnating as us. Then no, we do not live simply in answered prayer. We live as answered prayer. That means this word, this conversation, this divine energy already is made flesh. Breathe and be it. And so it is. And so it is. It is.